Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, Let's turn, turn tragedy, tragedy to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. Uh, I think we are live now. Uh, don't know what happened last week for all of you that were looking for the podcast last week. Uh, Facebook, for some reason, just randomly decides that it doesn't want to let me stream live, and I'm not sure what's going on. I don't. I didn't actually change anything, but now it's letting me do it again, and it seems to go back and forth like that. Anyways, welcome, everyone, uh, to the High Thrive Coaching or the Thriving Marriage uh, podcast. My name is Mark Johnston, head coach and uh, you know co-founder of High Thrive Coaching. So this week's topic, this week's topic is actually the um, that whole phrase, the the dreaded phrase that many of you have heard. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. You know, it's. It's a terrible, terrible thing to hear. I mean, a lot of you who hear this, you feel like, okay, things are going along fine. Maybe maybe your, your marriage is a little bit rocky, um, but you, you feel like you got it. It's, it's okay. And then you hear those words and everything just kind of comes crashing down and you feel like, oh no, what do I do about this? You know, some of the things I hear um, coming from these situations from people who say this, uh, you might hear, love, love shouldn't be work. Or, you know, if I don't have those feelings, there's nothing to be done about it. And, you know, then, of course, the words, I love you. Like, I have trust and commitment toward you, but I, I'm not in love with you. If you've heard the, any of these phrases, then please listen to this episode. I'm going to be going all in talking about that loss of romance or loss of love. But before we get to that... We're going to go over our client win of the week. Um, so I always, I, I love going into this. I always go into the Facebook group and find the, the best win because uh, you know what? We have them all the time. Great wins within the group. Uh, I always, you know, I like to try to protect uh, identity, at least to a certain extent. So we, we do change the names on this. But this week's win is coming from, we'll, we'll just call her Lindsay. Uh, so Lindsay had been trying to talk about her relationship with her husband for, um, for some time and it kept getting shut down. And so Lindsay decided to back off for a bit and just didn't talk about the relationship for a few months. And lo and behold, you know, as she backed off, her, her husband actually started opening up, started um, being a bit proactive himself and being open with his feelings. And when they listen, uh, when they started listening to each other, they started talking. I uh, they really got down deep into all the things that have been happening in their recent history. And her husband said that he's ready to work on the relationship. He doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to go anywhere else. He doesn't want divorce. He doesn't want separation. And he he really wants to make things work. Now I like looking at these wins, and I like examining. Okay, what happened here? Now, and with Lindsay, you know, she, she didn't give more information beyond this, but examining it a little bit, uh, I'm going to point out that probably when she was pushing, when she was try really trying to dig in on the relationship, uh, in terms of readiness, her husband probably wasn't ready to make some changes. Um, and this is, this is not uncommon. People go through different cycles uh, of change where they, they're more ready, less ready, and her husband just wasn't at one of those stages. Uh, it is important sometimes to be aware of that timing. And actually I did release a training recently in the subscription material talking about that timing, but yeah, the timing wasn't right. I'm guessing also here that Lindsay probably even backed off just a little bit. She backed off slightly, creating a situation where her partner was curious or interested in what was going on. A lot of uh, experts, talk about this ph phenomenon, you know, having a dynamic of the avoidant partner versus the, the pursuing partner. 
and that typically the best situation can come about as the avoidant partner learns to be a little bit more present and the pursuing partner learns to back, back up, down a little bit and you know give the avoidant partner a little bit of time. Um, it's very possible in, that in this situation also that the husband started to become uncomfortable knowing that she was unhappy, but now she wasn't saying anything about it. And he started wondering, okay, well, what happened here? Now, not all situations of silence necessarily should be handled like this. Uh, it does take knowing when is a good time to push. And like, as I mentioned, I did just release a new training on uh, this this month in our subscription material on um, identifying that right timing um, to, to push and to ask for some changes. So if that's a concern of yours, you know, you might check that out. So back into our topic that uh, the topic of uh, th those dreaded words, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. And in examining a phrase such as that, I like to clarify what's actually being said. You know, that I love you, but I'm not in love, love with you is essentially saying, uh, I trust you. I'm, com you know, I have some commitment to you. I'm used to being around you. Um, I just don't have that romance or spark in in the marriage anymore. I don't have those butterflies or things like that. You know, and I thinking about this, I, I'm thinking, okay, well, what actually is what what is that romance or or spark? Uh, because I, you know, this is a topic I, I frequently have to talk about. You know, I've, I've given this a lot of thought. And, you know, a lot of people, when they are uttering this phrase, it's, it's expressing a need uh, or a lack of something. It's a, this uh, need for desire, you know, a wanting to be with their partner. A, or it's a wanting to actually have excitement to be with someone. It's about having some anticipation. You know, can you look forward to being with your partner. It's about having some passion in your life or even, you know, something that I find uh, is, a, you know, a little bit more common in long-term relationships that are long-term healthy relationships that are still having this uh, romance component is uh, it's about cherishing your partner. You know, the opposite of um, one of the four horsemen of divorce, uh, according to John Gottman, which is, you know, a contempt, a, is that appreciation, that cherishing, that really deep satisfaction of, of being with your partner. It tends to be a bit more characteristic of the romance in later stages. Which does bring me to the topic of stages of love. And I do think that... Um, the discussion of this phrase of a loss of romance ha is very closely tied to different stages of love. Uh, you know, in many theories, it, 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 essentially love goes through many similar, you know, m similar th uh, theories that talk about this topic go through similar stages. You know, in this case, we'll use three stages here that typically couples go through a what's called a limerence stage, a stage where they're falling in love, where there's a lot of passion, a lot of excitement, a lot of desire. And this is precisely what these people who say that they've lost that romance, what they're longing for. This is especially true when in cases of affairs, where you say, I don't have these feelings with my partner, but for some reason I have it with this other person. You, you have those beginning stages of love that is very exciting, very different, very new. It's, it's the limerence stage. Now, here's the thing about these stages is they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. I would say that, you know, I, not to toot my own horn, but I feel like my wife and I um, really maintain this level of limerence and excitement and desire for each other, even uh, 15 years after being married, even after having five kids. Um, and, you know, I, I think I'm being pretty objective with that, such as, you know, we, my wife and I do get comments time to time with just people walking up to us and expressing that it's nice to see, um, you know, a married couple that just looks in love. 
Uh, we've, we've gotten that on, on numerous occasions. But you know, what I'm saying here is that first stage doesn't have to die away. I'm just going to, that's the point I'm making right here. The second stage, however, is of building trust. Do, can I rely on you? Can I actually lean on you? Can I, uh, can I be open or vulnerable with you? And you don't really need that at those beginning stages. As people tend to build up trust with each other, they tend to uh, introduce more responsibilities into the relationship, which sometimes actually can present problems for that romance, that limerence. Not to say that it's bad, that you shouldn't um, build up trust, absolutely not, but if not done right, can have that effect. And then the third stage would be a building up commitment and loyalty, such that you know it, it's a resilience or constitution or health of a relationship, such that you are starting to build up this idea that not only do I like being around you and I trust you, I can lean on you, but I can have some understanding if things aren't ideal 100% of the time. Um, and these are tend to be sequential. You don't tend to build up commitment and loyalty before limerence. That just wouldn't make sense in a romantic relationship. So knowing these stages, what happens in a marriage when you hear this phrase? I will say that it's easy to have spark romance, limerence, desire, all those things, all those great things when there's very little else to focus on in the relationship. Excuse me. In most circumstances, when a couple spends enough time together, I, you know, and they start to, they start to shift into those later stages of love where they are building trust and commitment and they stop focusing on the desire a not uncommon arc is for young couples to, to marry. And then they start to introduce children, which introduces more bills, which introduces more work, which tends to lead towards this over time, naturally anyway, to growing careers and uh, a lot of growth outside of the relationship and just growing responsibilities all around. And because of this, it becomes very easy to focus on other responsibilities, believing that your relationship is very solid and stable. But if enough time passes in this state where many other responsibilities and are, are focused on, and that limerence, that desire is not focused on, all the positive things are not focused on, it becomes and inevitable that love will die. Now, some, some relationships are gonna be a little bit more resilient than others, but given enough time in the state, it, it's a matter of it, uh, when rather than if. It's important then to understand what kills this, that spark. Because you know a, a thing that I discuss with my clients is especially if there are big problems in a marriage, it's important to understand what causes the problems so that you can remove those causes um, before you start building it up. You know, for instance, you know, I, to, just to be blunt, I mean, you're not going to heal from stab wounds if someone keeps stabbing you, even if you're applying solutions like bandages and bed rest. You have to remove the source of those, the pain first before you can start to heal and to improve. So, you know, as I was mentioning, focus uh, and attention start to go to other places. And a big killer of romance is a lack of time together. I, I, I see it over and over again. You know, I, when I start to hear about um, a lack of connection, one of the first questions I ask is about how well they connect and how much time they are spending together. And you, well, I was gonna say you'd be surprised, but you might not be. You might not be surprised here that, you know, a lot of couples that are in that situation, they, I hear about incompatible schedules, you know, where the couple might be working opposite schedules uh, or something similar like that. 
uh, or they basically say, you know, I get home from work, we focus on the kids the entire evening, and then, uh, you know, when the kids go to bed, either we're going to bed or we focus on, on our own hobbies. No, you know, not spending time together will kill your relationship. It will kill that, that romance. You know, I'm really grateful, really, really grateful that, you know, my wife and I have made that a priority. I, uh, you know, I, I hear about other couples time together and I just I kind of, I wonder how they're still, still together. You know, my wife and I, you know, we, you know, most of our kids are still young. Our oldest is 13. Um, but, you know, we, we basically have put a boundary in place. We say essentially that we are no longer parents after eight o'clock. And so our, our goal is, especially the younger kids, to make sure that they're in bed by that hour. Um, and that the older kids, we just say, essentially, don't bother us. <laughs> that might sound harsh, but it's, it's a measure to make sure that my wife and I can protect our relationship uh, so that we can spend that time together and still have a little bit of time for ourselves. Another spark killer is stress and overload. Kids, increased work schedules and work responsibilities, financial problems. It's really hard to feel happy and excited and, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, romantic or any of those nice things if you're stressed. You know, I will frequently hear this from women and we, we get this, we get this, uh, uh, dynamic quite frequently in relationships where, uh, you know, the, the cliche, the stereotype is the, the husband goes in to a, make a bid to have a romantic, sexy evening. And the, the, the cliche is that the wife complains of a headache and, and declines. Well, <laughs> I've, I've spoken about that with my wife and she's like, oh, no, it's, it's very clear. It's because that, that woman is, is overly stressed, has too much burden. Uh, and actually, this is something my wife and I want to, to do a training on our, ourselves, is the, the amount of mental load in, in a relationship and where that mental load sits. And quite frequently, the person who carries the greater mental load, and I will just say that 90% of the time, it's probably the, the woman in the relationship, you know, who probably takes on the majority of the responsibilities in the home. And in many cases, especially in this day and age, uh, is also working outside of the home. Um, it's probably going to have a, a lot more stress and is going to be less romantic. Um, further spark killers would be just the administration of marriage. You know, if you're interact, if you do interact, but most of your interactions are limited to mostly business, the kids, the finances, the work, home, um, chores and stuff. You know, administration is going to lead to arguments. Uh, and the cup, if the couple gets to be conditioned to think that talking is going to lead to heavy discussion and arguments, it's going to kill your spark. I really happen to like the advice of, of a book that I read it some time ago. Uh, it's called Fighting for Your Marriage. I, I think it's, it's several authors. The, the, I know the cover of the one that I have, it's a, it's a red cover and it looks like uh, these uh, construction equipment is putting together this heart. But uh, one of the, the big takeaways from that book that I, I remember was its suggestion to um, really protect pleasant moments together uh, as, as a couple to make sure that there is room to enjoy each other's company. So, but if most of your discussions are mostly about business, you might need to make life simpler, cut finances and costs, or limit your discussion to only top priority business items. Further spark killers, you know, if there's desperation, fear, anxiety, or control, perhaps, uh, you know, these sort of things, it's just not conducive to a sexy time, a romantic time. Um, and, you know, especially during a marriage crisis, we can combine a lot of these things. If there is desperation or a focus on business or a lot of stress, or you're starting to pull apart and not have time together, it all spirals and goes down the drain it just, it, it, there's a momentum to it. Um, you know, and during a marriage crisis, the, there tends to be a focus, an extreme focus on what's going wrong combined with all these other things. So 
as I mentioned, these factors kill romance. And, um, you know, the limitation of the, the podcast here is such that, you know, we can't go over every single solution to this problem and today, but I do want to talk about uh, where to start. You know, if this is, uh, if your marriage is getting to this point, or if you've actually heard that, that phrase, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Um, much like I mentioned earlier in what I tell a lot of my clients is to start by removing obstacles um, and limiting, removing or limiting as many of these spark killers as possible. I mean, there's almost always, uh, this is almost always the path forward when in crisis. You remove the obstacles and then work towards progress. And the thing is people almost always get this wrong, preferring to push past the obstacles and, and strong arm solutions. I see this mistake over and over again with counselors who are not experienced and uh, say couples counseling, couples therapy, couples coaching, however you might want to put it, where they say, you know, they see, okay, I see that the couple is fighting. I see that there's a lot of stress and resentment. I'm going to suggest mm, you should go out on dates. Okay. This is basically, you know, a stance that of ignoring the obstacles and pushing past it. And it just, it doesn't work. I, uh, you know, put simply, you won't have a strong romantic marriage. You won't if you're working opposite schedules and only seeing each other in passing. You won't have a strong romantic marriage if, if you are, if there are behaviors that are increasing stress or desperation or fear. Um, even if you work towards those solutions, like having a date on those few hours that you might have together during the week, solutions won't work well when there are active sources of pain. And I go back to my analogy, you won't heal from stab wounds if someone keeps stabbing you. Even if you apply the bandages and even if you are seeking bed rest, if someone is stabbing you there and causing more problems, more pain, it's, it's not gonna be effective. So with that said, um, I, of course, as always, the, um, the best course of action, if you are hearing this sort of phrase, is you're gonna need some, um, you're need, gonna need some feedback. You're gonna need some help. This is not a phrase you take lightly. This is not something that you try to solve on your own. Even if you are the only one trying to resolve this issue, you need to seek help. Because, you know, I could list off a dozen solutions. And the problem with that is it's going to be hard to determine when these solutions should be applied universally or, you know, when they should apply to your situation or in what order or whether those are the right solutions. Because sometimes, you know, it might be about setting boundaries. Other times it might be making about, it might be about making yourself more available. It might be about something else entirely. And if you are yourself, you know, not, not seeing much improvement or feeling a little bit confused, I mean, that's what professional help is for, is to help you through those things. And I highly, highly recommend you seek help if you have heard uh, that phrase, because it's not a problem that just simply goes away on its own. So with that said, I want to get into our, our marriage myth buster. And, you know, I do like to apply the different segments that we have um, to, you know, to the topic for the week. In this case, the marriage myth buster this week is the idea that we have no control over our feelings. Um, I hear this a lot, especially with the problem of this loss of romance or loss of spark. It's this idea that if I don't feel love, then there's nothing to be done about it. If I don't feel this desire, then it's impossible to work out our marriage. Um, there, there's nothing to be done to regain the romance in our relationship because I don't feel it. And you can't force feelings is the idea. And I'm gonna say this is simply false, not true in the least. 
uh, it's speaks more of a an individual's motivation that certainly that's uh, I think a little bit more what's going on here and even that you know your motivation can be adjusted uh, it, there can be areas of compromise there can be areas where you actually focus in on you know where your partner focuses in on things that really are motivating for them and it creates avenues to create some change but you know there are whole fields here that or whole areas of study that you know focus completely on adjusting feelings um, lots of things that can be done uh, for instance you know a favorite of mine in terms of exercises or in terms of affecting emotions my go-to is, you know, going through meditative exercises. I think meditation is a great way to practice feelings, to help support feelings, and uh, to help decide feelings if you're doing it correctly. You know, instead of just simply emptying your mind and relaxing, if you're actually having some focused meditative exercises, it can be really a great way to practice feeling confident, practice feeling love, accepting love, um, putting out love, you know, having appreciation for others. Uh, there are many, you know, many exercises within the realm of meditation that support that. Uh, if meditation is really difficult for you, I, I could probably name a dozen other exercises just off the top of my head without even needing to think about it much uh, to, that could have an impact on emotion. Uh, visualization exercises would be, you know, one example of this. Clearing exercises, you know, to remove uh, unwanted feelings would be another example. Uh, you know, certain, even cognitive exercises are going to have an impact on emotions, such as narrative, um, you know, like a narrative exercise where you rewrite um, your story or description of how things are. Um, even journaling can have an impact on emotion as you, you know, try to find, uh, you know, the things that you appreciate about someone or that you're journaling about the, the successes that you had. You know, many, many things that can adjust your beliefs, adjust your thoughts, and adjust your fe feelings or emotions. And love is, love, romance, spark is not immune to these things. Um, so, I mean, if you're hearing that excuse from your partner, that's, I, I recognize that that's difficult, that's frustrating, but it, it is simply not true. It's, there, there, there's no merit to it. It's just, it's, and if your partner fights you on that, it, it's more an indication that their motivation is, is a bit lacking. And there's certainly things even there you can do to support that which we don't really have time to go over today. But, you know, if you are here, like, as I mentioned before, if you are hearing this phrase, if you are experiencing this loss of desire or love, you'd like to get it back, or you're trying to figure out how to support your husband or wife or your partner in general, uh, you're looking to support how to help them build that, that emotion back into your relationship. If you're not sure where to go with this, please get help. Um, Myself and my, you know, my fellow, my fellow coaches and other staff here at High Thrive Coaching, this is this is what we do. We don't do anything else other than help people with their relationships. And this is honestly, uh, if I if I come across anyone who's actually really motivated to solve this problem, this is a highlight of my day to work with those people. Uh, simply because, you know, I love taking those situations where people just want to feel better about each other, want to experience more love and, you know, taking a not disastrous situation and really improving it. That's, that's the kind of thing. That's why I'm in this business to, to begin with. I, I absolutely love getting engaged with that. If you need some help from uh, myself or our team, let us know. You can always go and get a uh, talk with one of our team members to see if our program is right for you. Uh, where you would go for that, you can go to www.highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. Uh, and we would love to work something out with you. Um, you know, basically you can go there, set up a time to, to talk with one of our team members, see if the program is right for you. Well, uh, 
thank you all for listening. Uh, next week, we're going to come at you with another <laughs> podcast, you know, assuming that we don't experience more technical problems. But, you know, please come back next week. You know, we every week we aim to put out another one of these podcasts uh, talking to you all about the, the secrets of marriage and how to how to get over the, you know, marriage crisis. Uh, wonderful to have you all here. Thanks for listening and we'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.